Hello, group formerly known as History 72A, Spring Quarter 2024. No, Winter Quarter 2024. With Lecture 20, we will be completing Module E and the Enlightenment. Cue cheering. Yay! That we finally escaped the Enlightenment, except that we never really escaped the Enlightenment, which is why I've spent so much time on it. Taxonomy is the science of classification. In this lecture, we will look at the way that Enlightenment ideas of sex and gender were read onto nature, and then nature was taken as the basis of sex and gender. In Enlightenment minds, sex became the organizing principle, not just of human society, but of all life. If humans reproduced from two sexes, then so must all animals, so must all living creatures. In 1745, Charles Binet proved that aphids reproduced by parthenogenesis, but by that time the norm of sexual reproduction had been set so that any form of reproduction other than sexual became the exception. From animals, the Enlightenment fixation with a sexual binary extended to plants. In the 1730s, Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish naturalist, proposed a system of classification that worked well for scientists. We still use an only slightly modified form of that classification system. Canis familiaris, otherwise known as the domestic dog, is in the kingdom Animalia. Notice it is a kingdom and not a queendom phylum, chordata, and so on until you get to genus, canis, and species familiaris. Scientists now use the binomial to indicate what a specimen is across languages. Canis familiaris is a dog and is more similar to Canis lupus, the wolf, in many ways than to Odicoilus virginiensis, or the white-tailed deer. If you write a paper on Canis familiaris, a scientist will know or can easily find out your subject, even if they call the associated animal Inu rather than dog. Linnaeus's first love was botany, and his famous classificatory system, the system of giving life forms a binomial Latin name representing genus and species, was based on assumptions about the sexual nature of plants. In classifying plants, Linnaeus focused on the parts involved in reproduction as a single most important feature in defining natural groups. The pistil became the seed-bearing ovary of plants, and the stamen plus anther became the botanical penis. Culturally defined ideas about gender were then read onto the sex of plants. If it seems like I am exaggerating about the projection of culturally constructed definitions of sex onto everything, consider. Physician and botanist Rudolf Jakob Camerarius wrote, quote, It seems rational to denote these apices, meaning the anthers and plants, by a more noble name and attribute to them the importance of masculine sexual organs. It is there that the semen, the powder that constitutes the subtlest part of the plant, accumulates, and it is from there that it later flows forth. In case you are not a botanist and have forgotten your flower parts, the noble plant penis is labeled here. Linnaeus's plant grouping monoecia, meaning one house, was so named because in these plants, and this is a quote, husbands live with their wives in the same house but have different beds. These are plants we're talking about here. The class Polygamia Iqualis, Latin for equal polygamy, was so designated by Linnaeus because he determined reproduction to consist of, and once again this is a quote, consist of many marriages with promiscuous intercourse. Linnaeus was still talking about plants there. This is the drawing <laughs> that Linnaeus made of this plant here, which he called Andromeda. It is more popularly known as a bog rosemary. And if you have forgotten your mythology and or your Mediterranean mythology, Andromeda was chained to a rock and had to be rescued before she was eaten by the monster. 
spelling it out. The nobility of masculine sexual organs, particularly in plants, is a rational characterization only in cultural and historical context. Likewise, words like husband, wife, marriage, and promiscuous are loaded with socially determined assumptions that add layers of meaning and that reinforce cultural practices and values that have nothing to do with empirical observation and testing. Again, to make it clear, the claim of Enlightenment thinkers was that social structures emerged definitively from nature, but Enlightenment thinkers organized, described, and understood nature in terms of social practices and values. Women with flowers in art, what you're looking at on the slide here, were a big thing with both kind and unkind messages. Check out the coda to this lecture for more on flowers and gender sex. The projection of social customs and values onto the natural world matters to us in this class, in part because by the time these ideas got to the 19th century social theory, the groundwork laid in the Enlightenment had gained tremendous force. The incredibly powerful assumption had become that physical evidence as nature provided the point of certainty from which social theory could build. Scientists had become the voice of authority and truth, moving in on what had been the purview of the church. Scientists claimed an objective view from above, untouched by issues of society and emotion. And science had also become pretty much exclusively the domain of white men. There is nothing about being white and male or English speaking that makes a person impervious to their historical context, or in other words, there is nothing that makes them truly objective. If nothing else, you should get that from the changes in European men's clothing in the pictures I've been showing you all session. Clearly, there was no single type of masculine clothing dictated by nature and chosen by minds free of societal influence. You are looking at this image here at members of the British Royal Academy of Surgeons in 1894 after the end point of this class, but still, as in the Enlightenment, exclusively white men, apparently wearing precisely the same suit as everyone else in the room meant that you were completely removed from and not influenced by social norms and were therefore completely objective. That is sarcasm on my part, in case you're not, you're not with me on that. The exclusion of women and people of color from science, education, and politics was not a foregone result of the upheavals of the Enlightenment. It was the product of hard and quite deliberate fights to keep these people excluded. The idea of how the sexes differed also came to have significant ramifications for the formation of early United States law, politics, and society. In other words, American law and government were constructed right from the start on the basis of a hard gender binary in which only one gender was assumed to be competent to make and enforce the rules. You've seen this Declaration of Independence painting already several times. The ideas and ideals that these men held, and they are called the Founding Fathers, for a reason, were outgrowths of European philosophy and science. In an emerging society in which democratic ideals were replacing divinely ordained hierarchies, the variety of people claiming natural rights was growing. You know from lectures and readings that European and American women enslaved people in the new United States and Haitian revolutionaries all pointed out that, as humans, they should be able to lay claim to natural human rights. Struggles over power on both sides of the Atlantic were neither abstract nor invisible. Sex was not the only incommensurable division being consolidated and naturalized in the 18th century. There was also the public sphere and the private sphere, the world of reason and the world of emotion, the civilized and the primitive. 
every division came with differential access to power and rights and with biological justifications of the natural order of things. I chose for this slide here the least horrible of the anthropological charts connecting race, skull shape, and supposedly natural character. Among the philosophers whose work was pivotal in both the development of Enlightenment political philosophy in the lead up to revolutions and in providing a framework for anti-feminists through the following centuries was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. If you go on to study any sort of political history or social theory, or if you've done so already, you will or have encountered Rousseau at some point. To treat his overall contributions extremely superficially in this lecture here, if you've studied any American history, you may well recognize some of his ideas. For example, humans are good by nature, but rendered corrupt by society. From The Social Contract, that's the name of one of his works, we get laws are binding only when they are supported by the general will of the people, and the fundamental question of politics is the need to reconcile the freedom of the individual with the authority of the state. And from his discourse on the origins of inequality, quote, humanity undergoes multi-stage evolution from primitive to modern complex society. Rousseau also held a powerful resentment against the women who ran salons in France. The 18th century salon had nothing to do with hair or nails. It was an influential social space for educated and cultured conversation. The women who ran the salons, and it was women who ran these salons, possessed a great deal of clout in France before the French Revolution. Rousseau turned to the comparative anatomy being produced around him that we talked about in the last lecture to claim that women were the perfect complement of men, but most assuredly not men's equals. You are looking at the frontispiece of Rousseau's book, A Meal, from 1763. A Meal was intended as an instruction manual for parents. If we look at the imagery here, we will see the nurturing and miraculously unharried mother tending effortlessly, one might even say naturally, to a small or not so small group of children while simultaneously changing the nap of a baby and nursing an infant, all with a pleased, blissful smile on her face. The woman is sitting beneath a bust of Rousseau, and she is reading his manual, A Meal, so that she can learn, learn how to fulfill her totally natural place in the order of things. Yes, that is snark, unabashed snark. Rousseau was instrumental in promoting the view that the supposedly inherent physical, moral, and intellectual differences of women suited them for roles in society vastly different to those of men, roles that required women to remain in the private, not the public sphere. For Rousseau, the role of natural philosophy was to determine, supposedly from nature, this is a quote, everything which suits the constitution of her species and her sex in order to fulfill her place in the physical and moral order. Rousseau's expectation for what constituted a perfect woman in an ideal empire fed into the growing prominence of the 18th century ideal of Republican motherhood in the wake of consolidating nation states. Republican motherhood was the role assigned to educated, well-off women, white women, the sort of women who kept insisting that they should really have a role in the public sphere. I like the juxtaposition of these paintings. The young woman still has an expression of hope on her face. This woman here looks worn down. Her eyes seem to plead desperately for help, but her lips are pressed tightly closed in a grim line of resignation. 
It was the duty of a Republican mother to support the morality and strength of her republic or empire. She was supposed to achieve that goal through ensuring the proper education of her children to prepare them for the public sphere if boys or and for Republican motherhood if girls. The Republican mother was supposed to guide her husband towards moral choices while she herself should not try to exert any authority outside of the domestic sphere. What could be easier or more satisfying? I mean, I ask you. A feedback loop developed between Rousseau's ideas on women and the purportedly objective results of natural philosophy. The amount of ink spilled by predominantly male thinkers on what they called the woman question indicates how central justifying women's less powerful position was to Enlightenment discourse. Ostensibly, the idea was that a social life in harmony with nature would ensure individual well-being and social stability. But as we have seen, the natural was classified and defined in terms of the social. To look at a couple of examples, and you do not need to write the quotes down, I put quotes on the next group of slides because I know that my own attention lapses when someone reads quotes that I cannot see. I have these particular images here to show that while the idealized woman's torso was this sort of ice cream cone shape, the elongated cone supported by stays that we talked about before, the ideal for men, particularly as they got older, was to have a protruding belly, signifying wealth, prosperity, and success. And now to our Enlightenment text. The 1765 Encyclopedia entry on the skeleton used fully half its text in differentiating male and female bones and ended with the statement that, quote, all of these facts prove that the destiny of women is to have children and nourish them. You can see that these girls, while just children themselves, they just cannot wait to start caring for babies, which is totally natural and not shaped at all by the highly structured environment around and on them. Not at all. I love the cat's expression. 1775 medical doctor Pierre Roussel, Roussel, not to be confused with Rousseau, wrote, Nature has revealed through that special form given to the bones of woman that the differentiation of the sexes holds not only for a few superficial differences, but is the result perhaps of as many differences as there are organs in the human body. Roussel's list of organs included spirit and mind. The Enlightenment language of difference that circulated from society to nature and back again buttressed claims of a social order supposedly based in nature. This pattern became entrenched in political and scientific thought heading into the 19th century. The idea that men and women were fundamentally different creatures became increasingly applied to issues of what education should be made available to women and girls. This and the next few slides have long-ish quotes. Do not feel the need to write them down, but do pay attention to the claims that the speakers make to argue against an education for girls equivalent to that of boys. In 1808, in a lecture entitled Female, Nature, Character, and Education, given to their parents enrolling their children in a girls' school, the male head of the school stated, Already in the earliest stages of the embryo, one finds sex differences. That boys will seize a stick while girls will take up a doll. That men rule the affairs of state while women govern the affairs of the home reflects nothing other than what is already in the seed of the embryo. Don't remember having a lot of sticks or dolls lying around in my uterus for my embryo to grab, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Hegel, in 1821, wrote, Women are capable of education. 
but they are not made for the more advanced sciences, philosophy, and certain forms of artistic production, all of which require a universal faculty. Women may have quick wit, taste, and elegance, but they cannot attain the ideal. Women regulate their actions not by the demands of universality, but by arbitrary inclinations and opinions. They follow the dictates of subjectivity, not objectivity. This medical doctor, J.J. Sox, in 1830 wrote, the male body expresses positive strength, sharpening male understanding and independence, and equipping men for life in the state, in the arts and sciences. The female body expresses womanly softness and feeling. The roomy pelvis determines women for motherhood. The weak, soft members and delicate skin are witness of woman's narrower sphere of activity, of homebodiness and peaceful family life. And finally, we have Comte, 1839. The sound philosophy of biology begins to offer a scientific resolution to the much acclaimed equality of the sexes. The study of anatomy and physiology demonstrates that radical differences at once physical and moral profoundly separate the one sex from the other. Note that the section I put in italics demonstrates that Comte was arguing against a group that was pushing for sexual equality. In other words, not everyone accepted all authoritative views of incommensurable difference. Those views needed to be constantly reasserted in the face of resistance. By the end of the 18th century, reason and science were becoming strictly the realm of men, while women were associated with feeling and the moral sphere of the home. Again, this is deeply woven in with other social developments. As part of the 18th century shift to authoritative science with social prestige, medical practitioners sought the respect given to scientists. Part of this involved the removal of women from medical training, once again justified by circles of reasoning. Women were not capable of scientific education. Therefore, women could not get medical training. Therefore, women were not capable of medical practice. Hence, the removal of pregnancy and birth from the realm of the midwife to that of the medical doctor. I will note that maternal mortality went up during this period. The association between purported objectivity, reason, science, and masculinity existed beyond the medical field. Women were excluded from high status, education, and degrees. Thus, when they argued for equality, it could only be done from a place of feeling and emotion and was automatically considered a non-authoritative form of argument. This in turn proved the unscientific nature of women and justified their continued exclusion from higher education. The painting on the left is the positive reinforcement of women as too emotional for science. The men are about to do an experiment involving the bird, and the woman is too nurturing and emotional to even watch, which is presented as charming but weak. The hierarchy shown here is intentional man above woman, woman above child, but like child in her dependency on man, because she is too much under the control of her emotions to function on her own. I mean, can you picture this silly creature figuring out how to hunt and killing for food? Never mind, I will remind you that in the Puritan household, women were the ones who processed animals into food. The cartoon on the right is negative reinforcement. The caricatured female scientist cannot tell the difference between a comet and a fart. If we go back to the binaries that I have presented before, male, female, public sphere, private sphere, reason, emotion, civilized, primitive, we could see how the Enlightenment connected the pairs into sets. Male, public sphere, reason, civilized, Female, private sphere, emotion, primitive. The logic on that last pair, civilized, 
primitive was used to justify the denial of natural human rights to both European women and all non-Europeans to varying degrees. By the end of the 18th century, categories of race and sex had been developed to define standards of social worth. A major line of argument that not only extended into the 19th century, but had repercussions for pretty much everyone in the colonized world went like this. Male and female bodies were so vastly different that women's development must be arrested at a lower stage than the development of European men. European women therefore ranked below European men and were placed in a classification which included children and so-called primitive peoples. Note the return to the vertical ladder of being here, just dressed up differently. The European male is number one. We have seen that the scientific community took pains to exclude women, and we have seen that race was being constructed as an organizing principle of both European and Anglo-American society in tandem with the growth of commercial chattel slavery. In this context, white male scientists took their own bodies as the standard of excellence. Everyone else was defined in terms of how far they supposedly fell from the European male ideal. Circling back to debates over the correct female skeleton that we brought up last time, the medical community's preference for the Darkenville Sioux skeleton with its unusually small skull takes on yet another dimension. Natural reason was constructed during the 18th century, during the Enlightenment, as a prerequisite for political rights and social opportunities. The skull then was purported to provide an objective measure of intelligence. The idea being that the larger the skull, the greater the intelligence. But again, measuring, seeing, and interpreting did not occur in a vacuum. In one experiment, Summering, creator of the larger-headed competitor female skeleton illustration that we saw, discovered that women's skulls were actually larger than men's as a proportion of their body weight. One sixth for women, one ninth for men. So women must actually be more intelligent than men. But wait, you see how the skull on the right is clearly significantly bigger than the one on the left, correct? That's snark if you're uncertain. After Summering demonstrated that female skulls were actually larger than men's proportionately, the reasoning became women are sedentary and don't develop large bones and muscles, blood vessels, and nerves like men. Note the blending of causation here. Are the sexual distinctions natural or produced by social practice? Brain size and muscle size were assumed to be inversely related in this argument, so women's brains only seemed bigger because their muscles were smaller. By 1820, Barclay, he of the horse and ostrich skeletons in the last lecture, settled on a resolution to the problem of larger proportional skulls in women by noting that children's skulls were also larger in proportion to their bodies than men's. So it followed, according to Barclay, that women were not more intelligent than men, they just suffered from incomplete growth. Claims of the supposed inferiority of people with African ancestry followed similar patterns. European scientists claimed complete objectivity while making assertions such as that Africans had stronger, coarser nerves than Europeans and so had smaller brains. I'm really not sure what the logical connection is supposed to be there. But anyway, along with this went more primitive culture. Meanwhile, the interconnectedness of sex and race, as well as the lack of actual dispassionate and objective perspective, showed up in analyses of women with African ancestry. Some European scientists claimed that women with African ancestry were hypersexual because their genitals were supposedly formed differently to those of European women. 
At the same time, other European scientists claimed that women of African descent were insensitive. Note, not passionless, like European women, but lacking in sensitivity, unable to feel, for exactly the same reasons. That particular idea still haunts medical practice for Black women now. Black women suffer greater rates of maternal mortality than white women, in part because many doctors are still influenced by the idea that Black women are impervious to pain. The two women that you see in the image here are cousins. There are multiple dimensions and ramifications to the way that science was conceptualized in the West in the wake of the Enlightenment. One is the exclusion of anyone who is not a white European or European-derived male from the scientific community, higher education, and authoritative positions of knowledge. Another was the shaping of what counted as science or scientific approach. Anything associated with the female, private sphere, emotion, primitive group was set up as the antithesis of reason and truth. Moreover, this was a package deal in which the linkages could not be broken. In other words, no idea assigned to the female private sphere emotion primitive group could be moved to the authoritative group. None of this was a natural process. It was very much a social one. Key points for lecture 20. Enlightenment thinkers made a binary construction of sex the organizing principle, not only of 18th century European society, but of new taxonomies of animals and plants, including Linnaeus's famous classificatory system, kingdom, phylum, on down to genus species. Philosophers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and anatomists reinforced one another in claiming that men and women were completely and utterly different in every physical, mental, and moral aspect. The entire suite of supposed differences was then used to justify a division in which men, being associated with reason and objectivity, were entitled to occupy the public sphere of politics, science, fine arts and philosophy. Women, being associated with emotion, nurturing, and passionlessness, were linked to the domestic sphere of home and reproduction. Non-Europeans were largely excluded from all of these realms. Rather than justifying human relationships in terms of a cosmic ladder of being, one in which the relative positions were divinely determined before birth, 18th century European thinkers sought to prove that differences in social position were a result of nature. Thus, whether people were arguing that women should or should not have access to the public sphere of politics, economy, and academics, they argued from the assumption that men and women were fundamentally different. There was not, however, equal weight behind both sides. Most women were excluded from these discussions most of the time. The ideal of Republican motherhood made political and legal participation difficult, even for well-to-do white women. It did not mean that women of any kind just passively stayed home. All other women meaning all women who were not white and upper class, were excluded as a matter of course from womanhood. They did not stay passively at home because they worked, including in some cases doing the same labor as men. These women did not unquestioningly accept abuse and marginalization, but their actions as women were necessarily combined with resisting other vectors of power. Republican motherhood was an ideal it could only be remotely a possibility for an exceedingly small group of women in America. A hierarchy involving differential access to power and rights was supported in an age of equality and democracy by invoking a natural order of difference. As science became the voice of authority and accrued social prestige, medical practitioners used the emerging discourses of natural binaries to exclude women from medical training. Scientific training and higher education of all kinds were denied to women, 
and anyone without European ancestry on the grounds that only European men possessed the ideal traits of reason and objectivity. Women and non-Europeans were considered lower in the natural order of things. These patterns would be carried through into the 19th century and beyond. They still haunt us now. In a past discussion of rhetorical femininity, I found that art history has the term floral femininity. The association of women with flowers is so common in Western art that it doesn't really strike us as remarkable in any way. It seems natural and normal. And that is generally a sign that we have internalized meanings largely unchallenged. Flowers could be likened to the delicate beauty of a woman, or a woman could be likened to a flower. Both of these are used as if complements, but the understanding is that the beauty of both flower and woman will fade, and what good is a woman if she is not beautiful? I happen to like Fall Out Boy, so this is not a knock on them, but they do have the line in one of their songs. You're a cherry blossom, you're about to bloom. You look so pretty, but you're gone so soon. The types of flowers could have meaning, although the Victorians really elaborated the whole language of flowers thing. Even without focusing on particular types of flowers, there were meanings in where the flowers were in the painting and in how they were being treated. This painting is mid-18th century, mid-1700s, and is called Simplicity. The woman, or really, she's, she's a girl here, is pulling petals from a daisy, doing the he loves me, he loves me not thing, future telling for love game. It's all innocence and sweet first love. I don't think anyone does this anymore, which is a good thing. Don't torture daisies. They're lovely things. But you pull off a petal and you say, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. When you get to the last petal to come off, then that tells you. This painting is 19th century. It is Monet's bar at the Folie Bergère. The flowers in the vase are all about freshness, youth, and beauty, but the flowers on her bosom are not. Combined with the oranges, and her job tending bar. The flowers that she wears indicate that she is a sex worker, at least part-time. The flowers form a red triangle, referencing the brand of beer with a bottle on each side of her. The layer of meaning there is that, like the beer, she is a commodity to be consumed. You might also remember the earlier established association of alcohol with the lower classes and women of ill repute, even if she is not the one actually buying and consuming the alcohol here. She has a mirror behind her, and you can see that she's interacting with a prospective male client. Monet's composition in the last slide carries another layer of commentary. This painting on this slide here is 18th century. Flowers symbolize love here, but the flowers are still linked to the idea of woman. Flowers mean love. Woman is meant for love. Monet was deliberately comparing supposedly chaste romantic love with decidedly unchaste and unromantic sexual intercourse as a business exchange. Monet's use of the flower to indicate sex, as opposed to love, showed up in the 18th century well before Monet. In this Rococo piece on the right, there are flowers in the center beneath the woman, but the woman herself is painted to resemble the large pink roses often used to symbolize love in the 18th century. This painting relies on the association of love and women as sex. Swings in 18th century art meant sex, and if you are wondering why, if we zoom in, we notice a man down here. He is, in fact, actually looking up her skirt. She is either too silly or too venal to protect her virtue. The action of kicking off the shoe suggests that she knows he is looking and that she is okay with it. Either way, losing her virtue is like the roses being crushed under the man as he tries to get a better view. 
The flower in Western art has long symbolized the transience of life as well. This type of painting was falling out of favor in the Enlightenment, this type that you see on the slide here, falling out of favor in the Enlightenment, but had been spectacularly popular in the century before, and artists still reference this genre now. Any European in the early modern period would know what the symbolism in these paintings meant, and absolutely everything in this type of painting had meaning. The skull, of course, is a reminder of the inevitability of death. The skull is usually missing teeth just to rub it in. These flowers are fresh and beautiful. These are wilting, indicating the transience of love and of life. The bouquet that will inevitably wilt in both is made of roses for beauty and love. These small blue flowers here are forget-me-nots, a play on the idea that death is the ultimate forgetting of earthly love. The hourglass symbolizes the passage of time. Sometimes there are watches or a candle. The candle could be shown a light or snuffed out, like life being snuffed out. This candle is not only snuffed out recently, you still see a little bit of glow, it is also broken. Someone was having a very bad day. It's difficult to see, but these are soap bubbles that, like butterflies, flowers, and flame, have only a moment of light. The genre is called vanitas, vanitas painting or vanitas still life. The name vanitas does not refer to vanity of looks in these cases, but to the vain hope of keeping earthly treasures. A reminder to people that their immortal souls were more valuable than collecting wealth. The paper below the skull on the last slide, paper which was already starting to decay if you looked at it, carries the words non remaneris or do not wait. So these are about the transience of life and enjoyment generally. But it is a short jump to the criticism of women for either trying to appear in a way that was socially rewarded or even expected of them, or trying to enjoy their own being and the pleasures of life. Men were permitted to enjoy the beauty of a woman's body. A woman was not permitted to enjoy the beauty of her own body. The mirror indicates that her attention is on her physical self rather than her spiritual. Or you can read it as the evil of a woman who provided herself with self-affirmation rather than valuing herself by her utility to a man. She's clearly evil because you see a devil with her here. The Grim Reaper indicates that her beauty will pass with age because she might be evil enough to continue valuing herself as she ages. After all, what could be more useless than a woman who no longer conforms to societal standards of beauty because she has reached the same stage in life as male scientists and politicians? The meaning of the juxtaposition in this image of the young bosom with the elderly one is screamingly obvious. This one might not be as obvious. This is a pomander. These decorative items would have something perfumey in them, uh, wax with embedded perfume. Pomanders had openings for the scent to flow out. The implication here is that it is being used to mask the stench of age and decay. The seated woman is holding a fresh flower in her right hand and a wilting one in her left. To end on a somewhat lighter note, I think that we are good on the multiple readings of the rose in this image here, including its position. The flowers in her hair here are pansies. Pansy symbolism used a play on English and French words to mean think of me. Thoughts, pensée in French, pensée also means pansies, plus pensée to think of sounds like pansy, especially if, like me, you tend to muddy your words. The play on pansy is even more clear in this ring. When the ovals are taken together, the ring reads, pensée à votre ami, think of your friend, implying here your special friend.